my pleasure to introduce our fourth presenter uh, of the day, uh, Catherine Porter Prescott. I don't think I've ever called you that, Kathy. Never had the Porter part before, but um, Catherine's a portrait painter, and she was born in Washington, D.C., but we're up at, through high school. She was a Wisconsinite, actually, yeah. like an actual resident of Wisconsin. We'd be happy to have you come back anytime. I'm here. And she even uh, tried out grad school here uh, one summer, but decided not not to do her MFA here. So um, in 2016, <laughs> she was one of the nine painters asked by the principal gallery in Charleston to exhibit portraits of the nine people killed at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, June 2015. The artists then gave their portraits to the victims' families. For many years, 20 years or more, uh, Kathy taught painting and drawing at Messiah College uh, with her husband, Ted, who chaired that department and taught sculpture. Um, I've known Ted and Kathy for many years, and, and uh, I know you and Ted to be really some of the leaders, in some ways, some of the founding members of what we might call the art and faith movement today. Um, in your way, you both taught hundreds of students over the years and been mentors to dozens and probably hundreds of artists. And um, when I introduced Wayne, I, our first speaker, I said, you know, it's so nice to have an art historian who actually has a studio practice too and brings that along. And so Catherine, someone who has a studio practice, but you're gonna discover soon, um, thinks deeply about all things as well. And so um, it's just lovely to kind of be in a mix with um, with artists who whose work is so excellent, but who think so well and who are so faithful. Um, last thing I wanna say, Catherine, to you is, uh, uh, lots of, by the way, I, I, I'm an artist and a writer as well. Some of you in the room know that full well, but others of you don't know that. But I'm an artist and a writer. And sometimes younger people will come to me like they do to you and say, well, you know, what do I need to do? And I have this short, un unhelpful answer. They probably think I'd say, well, you need to do the work. You just need to get up every day and do the work. And Kathy's one of the people who's been doing the work. So thanks for showing the way, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good morning. I think it is still morning. Um, and I'm so grateful to be at Upper House. It's a real honor to be here. I didn't know about this, and I find out it's this wonderful, amazing group uh, and provision for this idea of study, a study center that's uh, put together with Christians um, as well as everybody that wants to, can come in. So I really, I'm really impressed with that. And so thank you to my friend and colleague Cameron Anderson uh, and also for the invitation to speak um, by Melissa Shackelford, who is so helpful and so kind, and also your staff, <laughs> and also congratulations to Wayne and Asher and Alejandro for your work. It's just marvelous to have seen what I've seen today and, and heard what I've heard. Thank you. So you should know, too, that I, I grew up in Walworth, um, but I was aware Walworth, Wisconsin, it's it's a town of 1,500 people, and it's about 30 minutes from here. You may never even have heard of it. But it does have a difference uh, between Madison and Walworth, and that is that Madison, unlike us, has a mustard museum. So <laughs> just going to say, we're pretty good, but mm, that mustard museum is pretty special. <laughs> So I'm coming to you as a Christian, uh, as an artist and an art teacher. I'm coming to you as a wife and a mother. Uh, and I want to talk about two things today. Uh, one is that um, the culture in which I paint portraits is very specific. And I want to try to talk about that a little bit. And then also, I want to talk about what I'm after and how I get it to a certain extent, as much as I can. 
So I need picture. So this is my friend Daphne, uh, and I'm drawn to paint portraits of any kind because I'm compelled. I feel I'm compelled to par paint them, partly because of a strong p preference that I have for particularity. So I'm going to define particularity just simply as precise distinctions. I love to see that a person's two eyes are different from each other, which everybody's are. But this one is particularly strong. And how tiny changes from one color to the next, next door to each other, create a sense of fleshy form. Um, the words on this slide are of just a few concepts I will repeat in different contexts to make connections. Particularity, interiority, limitations, irrationality, and visible truth. I'll come back to those things more than once, at least. Um, and also, my premise is this, uh, which is that the particular persists in pointing to the universal. For me, that's very, very important. The cost of giving up particularity, for me, is our ability to know and be known to each other. So why am I starting with propaganda, comments about propaganda? Well, the first quote here comes from President Kennedy's speech in 1963 about the arts. At, he was at Amherst College. And art, he wrote, art is not a form of propaganda. It's a form of truth. So my interest here is not in the word propaganda, but in the word truth uh, as it relates to art. And Kennedy's speech was about the American poet Robert Frost and Frost's conviction that the power of poetry is to save power from itself, that the power of poetry is to save power from itself. And Kennedy continues, and he says, when power leads us to arrogance, poetry reminds us of our limitations. And as for my friend Power's comment, I like the idea that art has the possibility of opening up truth rather than telling us what to think. So two caveats. In 1963, when Kennedy wrote that, he referred to art. The word had boundaries. The word art had boundaries. Most people couldn't name the category, could name now the category, could name then, sorry, the categories of art, such as poetry, dance, and architecture, painting, drawing. And art has now become absolutely everything um, because it was, it's become anything. And I think uh, for this paper, I'm going to focus on the visual form of art, sometimes using the word image or picture instead of art. And specifically, I want to talk about images of people as a subject, and then even more specifically about portraits. So also, the other caveat is that art is that culturally truth, as Kennedy refers to it in 1963, refers to an agreed upon nar meta narrative. And I believe that we can see truth in images, visual truth, without agreement and without consensus. So here is Adrian Tomin's uh, really touching picture of online love life. It's a New Yorker cover, as you can see. Her date, who is invisible to us, sees only what is on screen, which is calculated to either reveal or hide something. What is true here for many of us is the familiarity. It's an image of a real event fragmented by the screen. The hope was that Zoom would be better than masks and safer. But now we know many school children weren't connecting with their teachers or their classmates because they couldn't see facial expressions and they couldn't see whole people six to eight hours a day. And the screen, the visual form, authorized the unreal, the artificial, taking the place of the real. I met a young woman once uh, before the digital revolution whose smile seemed kind of spooky to me, uh, very artificial, and I couldn't figure it out. Her words were interesting, but I didn't trust her. One day I asked her what she was doing with her face when she's in conversation. She had to, I had to push her a little bit to tell me um, she told me she was smiling only with her mouth. So she was teaching herself not to smile with her eyes. And you can guess why she didn't want to develop wrinkles around her eyes. 
She was staging herself. One reason she was so alienating is that the history of our emotions create lineaments. That's they etch the repeated movements of our flesh, causing hills and valleys and bumps and little lines. She wasn't creating many lineaments, so she appeared not to express emotions. My work as a portrait painter is to watch what causes a person's face to display their emotional history. I can see what facial or body movements they return to over and over, and the circumstances or conversational content that cause those movements. My careful rendering of a wrinkle means nothing unless it was generated by an emotion. This is my portrait of Benoni Oguala Buang. He's our, he was our priest at the Episcopal Church my family was attending in 1995. We called him Bishop Ben because he had been a bishop in Uganda. Idi Amin mutilated and murdered Ben's own bishop, and he had to run with his family through the woods in the dark to escape the knife himself. He left behind one son who later died of AIDS and lost another one in Harrisburg to gun violence. You can see at least part of his history on his face. It's in his features, but features themselves don't move that much. You don't move your eye around. It's the lineaments all around the features that reveal the anguish of his story. This is a series of 28 small portraits by Hannah Lee, taken from her website. Her credentials are striking. Hannah has received her BFA from Baylor University and her MFA from the New York Academy of Art. While there, she received a top honor, the New York Academy Scholar, in 2018, and was the commencement speaker at that school in 2020. Her artist statement says that her, this is her a quote, recent painting, print, and textile works explore the disconnect between who we truly are, how we represent ourselves, and how we are perceived. It sounds empathetic. What she cares about, we care about too. Her words are serious. But the people in the images are as artificial as my friend who would have no wrinkles. They're more like a mask. Hannah graduated from the preeminent representational art academy in the country, but sadly she enters into an art culture which rarely explores who we truly are. And these are maybe, you could say, immature, but she had something really strong to say in her in her uh, statement. That's what I want to point out. Because by contrast, here is Brenda Goodman, also an American portrait painter, contemporary, and emotionally, psychologically expressive. I'll read her statement. In this body of work, self-portraits done 2002 to 2007, my desire is to address concerns I'm facing as a 63-year-old woman and artist my intent is to extend the parameters of my specific and personal issues to reveal and comment on basic universal emotions and conditions. I want to remove the veils between myself and the viewer and communicate the palpability of needs met, of needs unmet, of needs never met, of rage, of fear, of vulnerability, of aging, and finally, of mortality as my work is about reality, not irony. Note the particular to, you, to the universal and the real versus ironic. Except for those two emphatic phrases, it sounds a little bit like Hannah Lee, her statement, but I want to focus on the content we can see as opposed to read. It's not particular in the sense of being a likeness, this painting. We have no idea what Brenda really looks like. Yet if we knew her, we might see, we might see, we might say, well, that's like her. Or perhaps even more universally, I've felt like that. You can see here that it's possible to load every inch of the painting with content. This figure is not fragmented. She's whole, she's the same person inside and out, and she's too little for the space. She's made so faint by those perspective lines indicating a box that's simultaneously empty and boxing her in. 
She's drastically alone, abandoned maybe, maybe forever. There's the details of it. You can't help but feel the wasting downward pull of the energy in her body. The belly, it sags. The lineaments show us the history of overextending the flesh, and we can imagine the future death of that surface. You can't look at the head where the face should be without feeling the eyes peering out at you from a place of barely being able to tolerate your presence. You shouldn't be looking at her. It would be a violation to laugh. She doesn't have any boundaries. Her extreme vulnerability makes us cringe. The wounds, both inside and out, are a believable story. The truth is visible in art. There's a connection between stories and portraits of people. Both require belief that an individual is knowable. This is writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. My favorite of her novels is Americana, if you've read that. It's terrific. She's a Nigerian, a practicing Catholic, and the US is her second home. I love this picture of her. She has serious moral certitude, but she speaks without arrogance. I recommend her TED Talk on the danger of a single story. She describes her first sojourn into American culture when she came here to college. Her new roommate wondered where, would she, where she learned to speak English. She says, never mind that the national language of Nigeria is English. She was asked to share her native tribal music and shocked her roommate by playing her favorite Mariah Carey tape. Her TED talk is a call to particularity and the correction of assumptions about a group. There is never just one story. There have always been illegitimate stories, lies about individuals, events, and entire people groups. But when falsehood enters, when falsehood enters the picture, illegitimacy, illegitimacy sorry, is nourished by visual images. It is estimated that we see some four to 10,000 advertisements with visual content a day. By contrast, in the 70s, it was thought to be around 500. Here is Frederick Douglass, the great orator, writer, and abolitionist, born in 1818. He entered a world in which it was common to see illustrations of African Americans as simianized men, women, and children. 19th century illustrations that depicted slaves who appeared to have features like a monkey, incapable of acting like little more than a beast, were published in pamphlets, in newspapers, and children's books. Douglas understood the power of an image to tell a lie and to reverse a lie. He imagined something he'd never seen, pictures of his true self as an antidote to these common signifiers. Imagination is, he believed, the salient difference between a man and an animal. He set out to make his imagination both visible and believable. He was fascinated with photography. One accepted date for the invention of the camera is 1838. That is the same year that Douglas, Frederick Douglass, was freed from slavery. Three years later, he had his first studio portrait made like these. He saw that because it was a machine, the public would trust its product as an objective record. The camera and its images would tell the truth. You can see these photographs in these photographs that he's a thinker. He has intellectual power. He has deep feelings. He's loaded with discernment. He has fortitude. He's anything but passive. He's consistent over time, and these photographs, it turns out, are about his mind. They have all the energy and spirit and interiority of this truth that he himself was a whole man. Abraham Lincoln, maybe you know this, had 127 photographic portraits done. Lakota Chief Red Cloud had 128. By contrast, Frederick Douglass had 160 different portraits made. The power and appeal of machines, like, like cameras, and their promise of progress was brought home to me some years ago in a small and ancient Italian city. I've lived in Orvieto some years ago, uh, off and on, since 1998, 
teaching for Gordon College in a program abroad. It's built on the flat top of an inactive volcano. Many of the buildings are made of volcanic rock. This is not a picture of it. And it's Etruscan, 8th to 3rd century BCE. I'm friends with a travel agent there who is quite well traveled and speaks perfect English. Once I was making a train reservation and she needed my US address. I'm from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. When I said the name, her whole demeanor changed. She said, oh, that's so cool. I'd just love to be from a town called Mechanicsburg. I said, what? And she told me, well, you know, anything with machines, anything mechanical is cool. And I was still baffled. Though she added, surprised that it wasn't obvious, she added, machines are modern. This machine is possibly the most emblematic, well, I'm up one ahead, is possibly the most em 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 emblematic image of the Industrial Revolution, you know that, which opened the way to modernization. This steam engine became a primary symbol of power and progress in the late 19th century. It literally was progress, which became the hope for conquering the limitations of humanity. My favorite Victorian novelist, Thomas Hardy, wrote about modernism and the power it gave humankind through the invention of machines. He was one among many at the time who connected it with a growing disbelief in the existence of God. Friedrich Nietzsche, who died in 1900, wrote in more than one book that God is dead, that philosophy contributed to the death of God, the theological movement by the 1950s and the, in the 60s. One idea that was crushed from the death of, crushed with the death of God is the belief that humanity is at the peak of creation. No longer are body, soul, and mind one distinct, whole, and independent entity. The hope was for progress in the further development of rational minds, minds proven or improved by machines. Hardy's writing about the loss of faith is most clear in his poem, God's Funeral. 18, 1910 to 19, 1908 to 1910, sorry. He depicts God's coffin as a, fun as a steam engine carrying his amorphous body past the mourners. I've isolated a few lines to read. I saw a slowly stepping train lined on the brows, scoop-eyed and bent and hoar, following in lines across the twilight plain a strange and mystic form the foremost bore. The foreborn shape to my blurred eyes at first seemed manlike, and anon to change to an amorphous cloud of marvelous size, at times endowed with wings of glorious range. And this phantasmal variousness ever possessed it as they drew along, yet throughout all it symboled nonetheless potency vast, and loving kindness strong. And tricked by our own early dream and need of solace, we grew self-deceived. Our making, soon our maker, did we dream. And what we had imagined, we believed. And though struck speechless, I did not forget that what was mourned for, I too once had prized. Each mourner shook his head. Some were right good, and many nigh the best. Thus dazed and puzzled, twitched the gleam and gloom. Mechanically, I followed with the rest. 25 years after Hardy completed God's funeral, Belgian artist René Magritte painted the portrait. Magritte was known for painting ordinary objects jarred out of their normal context. It's irrational to see a carefully rendered eye with no lid in a slice of ham that couldn't be a slice of ham. Because he was both inventive and skilled at representation, his work had some of the same shock that the camera as a truth-telling machine could effect. This was now only 40 years after Frederick Douglass died. It was a complete reversal of his hope in the credibility of accuracy, of visual truth. The imagination to deceive with images had new purpose in the hands of artists, both photographers and painters. The year before Magritte painted the portrait, Salvador Dali 
easily the most influential of the surrealists, painted this picture on the right. On the left is the famous Hollywood film star of the 1930s, the inimitable Mae West. You had to hear her sassy language and pointed humor to understand what Dali did to her. Here she is with her familiar feisty squint, a challenge to anyone who dared to challenge her unconventional ways. On the right is a painting by Salvador Dali, Mae West's face, which may be used as a surrealist apartment. Mae West was one of those stars who maintain their identity no matter what part they're playing. Uh, but we know nothing about her from looking at this image of, of Dali's. When Dali br brought his ideas from Spain to, to the Surrealist movement in 1929, he used these words to describe the movement's goal. Deception, repulsion, demoralization, confusion. The premise of Surrealism was, and I quote, to discredit completely the world of reality. It's not like we're going to believe that apartment image is real, but the manipulation of reality in images, and particularly a bombardment of those images, is part of what normalizes the deceptive, the repulsive, the demoralizing, and the confusing. This is the background or backstory for the deliberate creation of the irrational. About halfway between the surrealist apartment image and today, 2022, photographer Cindy Sherman began making her film stills. This first series is her groundbreaking self-portraits um, that are one of the most highly respected, internationally recognized, and enduring art of the last 50 years. The first series imitated the iconic stars and atmospheres of primarily black and white films. It looks like an old movie, and it's meant to. It's sentimental and familiar and has emotional content, or seems to, but it's a masquerade, a deception. These photographs of Sherman's are all Sherman, they're all her, from many of her later series, but they're not persons. They are fragmented, schizophrenic, and missing large parts of what would make them human. People love them as images, I love them, but the image you see is the entire lived life of that face. There's no before and no after. There's no story around them. There's no context. They're completely isolated from each other and from her, yet they are anything but superficial. They are psychologically loaded, but behind the face, there's no interior. You'll never know these people. They're literally a ghost in a shell. In his 1999 book of that title, The Ghost in the Shell, the late Robert Sobizic made the argument that, and I quote, the image of a human being once assumed to be a fixed entity has found traction in the demise of certainty in the singularity of the self and of the trust in the objectivity of photographic representation. It looks real, it looks familiar, but it can't be trusted. So Bizek references one idea that theorist Jean Baudrillard uh, from his book, The Ecstasy of Communication, which is that the, schiz the schizophrenic model, the fragmented, dissembled model of a human being represents, and here's a quote, the end of interiority and intimacy, unquote. I never read that book, but I love that, that what he said that. Mr. Zobizic, then curator of photography at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, is the only author I've ever written a fan letter to. He wrote me back saying, yes, it would be nice to hang on to intimacy and interiority, if only for moments now and then. This is my daughter, Grace. She was 27 when I painted this. It's hard to know what you're doing. This is for Asher. <laughs> this is something we had talked about and what you just said. Um, it's hard to figure out what your own art is about. My goal has always been to make a better painting, always trying to make a better one. And never, and, um, never mind what it means, in my, in my thinking. Um, working on quality and choosing moment by moment what you want to make a big deal out of is how you find out what matters to you. If you did figure it out, you might end up just copying yourself. In 2013, 
I got an email with a link to an article about my work. Now, I'm going to say something about what it said, just because I, I don't know how to do that. So I was not familiar with this author, and there was no interview that had taken place. It was published in Huffington Post, written by an artist and critic, Julia Clift. The title was Catherine Prescott Paints Real Well. Sorry, Catherine Prescott Paints Real Women. Those words, which communicated so very much of what I was and am working for, had never occurred to me. I knew I was a realist painter, but I didn't know someone else could see that my paintings were about real people. I never identified my purposes with those of Christian artists who work with biblical subject matter. And when a philosopher told me uh, that she sees Imago Dei, Imago, Imago, you said it, Imago Dei, it's differently. Okay. I accepted her perception, but it isn't what I'm going for. That's re reaching too high and not particular enough. I can't paint that. But Clift wrote, her work visualized the internal balancing act common to all people between stability in one's selfhood and fragility. She continued, personally, I find it especially novel to see women in these paintings treated with such uncompromising deference to their essential humanity. Portraits like these continue the long-standing tradition of articulating complex human interiority. I thought, wow, what she said. I'm trying to make a record of invisible truth in a convincing image of a person. So I'll show you a few more paintings of mine. This is Lois Dodd. Uh, she's a highly respected New York artist. She's primarily a landscape painter without being a naturalist. I'm thankful for our 40-year friendship. I've studied with her. I've studied her and her work, but my paintings look nothing like hers. Once on a visit to our house, she wanted to paint, she wanted to watch baseball, and she had my cat on her lap. So the next day I was kind of inspired to let me photograph her for a, another portrait. I've done two more be, before this. Those are my flatwork drawers that she's sitting on, my windows, my book, my pillow, my landscape, and my cat, but her intelligence and her approach to life, her interior life. We normally talk, when, uh, when we're together, we normally talk about colors and shapes, what she calls getting excited about stuff. But once in her New York studio, we talked about being an artist. And I said, you know, Lois, sometimes I get discouraged about the whole enterprise. She said, yeah, but when you think about what other people do with their time. Most of my paintings have stories. Some were told to me by the subjects themselves. These two paintings, these next two paintings, are not narrative, but the subjects were not just models. These two, I'm referring to these two paintings, sorry. They were students I knew, and both were studio assistants for my husband, Ted, a sculptor. A lot of my paintings come, come from my being a mother, and these two communicate a child growing up. I wanted to paint their intimacy and their complex human interiority. This and the next slide are narrative portraits. The whole image, this, the whole thing that you see all around them, as well as the person, came to me because of stories they or someone else told me. Val is an art teacher who I'm, who, whom I've always had, always wanted to paint, but I never had a context for her. Her father was a born artist who poured all his free time and creative energy into making the family home. She grew up in a house that was perpetually under construction. The family ate dinner, six people, on a, on a table saw. When her father died, half the rooms were still just framed in. As a grown-up, Val was driven to complete her projects, but her father's basement shop was around was uh, never produced anything, and the legacy was an albatross around her neck. After her father died, she took a sculpture class with my husband at Messiah University. Suddenly, the art studio redeemed a space full of tools, and there was my image. The arrangement of objects here is mine, as is the landscape and the interior with Lois, the one just before. I put together the image of a story like an, like an abstract painting. 
This is Sam. He was a teenager when he came to our church with his family. I wanted to paint him as well, but it was a few years again before I found an image. He liked the fact that I'm an artist, so we talked a bit off and on. He was alienated from church and theology, but he told his parents that he would like to talk to me about God. I went to their house, and he invited me to his room, which was like a studio, to see his art and talk. His mother had told me that he was probably on the spectrum, but that he didn't know it. Because he spoke very little, I wanted to be careful not to dominate the conversation. I dominated it. Afterward, I apologized, and he said, that's okay, I enjoy podcasts. <laughs> I photographed him in my studio, but later I went back to his room to photograph his art. He made that paper mask of Maroc, a, a video game character. The precision is astounding. He told me that Maroc is an evil character that he liked a lot. He wrote to me, everyone has a persona, and when you leave your house, you adopt a persona. I hope my persona can be seen in my furrowed brow, he wrote. Sam went to a summer art program at the Maryland Institute of Art to prepare to attend there. He invited his parents to a talent night the last weekend of the program. Later, his mother told me, he surprised us by doing a stand-up comedy routine about being autistic. Sam knows what a mask is and what it's for. In 2015, I was invited by Principal Gallery in Charleston to participate a project, this is what Cameron talked about, with eight other portrait painters. We were each asked to paint one of the Charleston Nine who were murdered by self-declared white supremacist Dylan Roof. They were praying together in Emanuel AMC Church when he shot them. We were asked to exhibit the paintings at the gallery on the anniversary of the massacre and then to donate the paintings to the families of the victims. When I learned that I had been chosen to paint the pastor, I was so moved and humbled I just hid my face in my hands for a long time. My assignment was especially difficult. All the other painters got together with their families and were given photographs to work from. I wasn't able to work with Mrs. Pinckney because she was so traumatized. During the shooting, she was in her husband's office right off the prayer meeting room, right off the prayer room where they were praying, hiding under his desk with her little daughter during the shooting. Pinckney was famous for his leadership in race issues and highly respected, so there were many news stories for me to choose from with pictures of him, and I watched videos and speeches, but they were all looked so different from each other. I had to kind of make up and try to paint who he was, a good likeness is never just about copying a photograph. I need the photographs for proportion and details, but they don't give me insight into who the person is. I just believed in him. At the exhibit, I talked with a young woman who knew him well and was supposed to be at the prayer meeting that night, but at the last minute, she didn't go. I asked her if it looks like him. She gave me a deep, silent nod, yes. There's never just one story about old women. There's never just one story about black pastors. And there's never just one story about autistic children. There's never just one story. The artists, Aziz and Kucher, were part of a movement, movement to return to the figure in the 1980s and 90s. The movement could be called ironic. But ha how these two got this image is no joke. What is ironic is that they give it a common women's name. Both were born in the late 50s. Aziz is US born, Kucher is Peruvian. They met in art school in San Francisco where they became pioneers in the art of digital imaging. This portrait, Maria, is from a series called Dystopia. No kidding. They developed a computer program in which they could erase facial features and substitute them with images of skin grafts. In the early 2000s, Aziz and Kucher moved on to a series called Interiors, which seems to be images of empty rooms and hall hallways, called, uh, and they're called interiors. Uh, and they, again, the revulsion is superficial. The unmistakable fleshy quality of the geometric walls 
and floors definitely appears to be photographs of skin, skin grafts stretched out flat. They're described by Smith art professor, art history professor Fraser Ward as, and I quote, metaphors for the collapse of distinctions between human and non-human, the attraction and the repulsion of the dissolution of limits. And now we return to Hannah Lee. Photo Did I miss, miss one? Yeah. Oh. Did you? Okay, did you see this one? Yeah, did you see this one already? Yeah, for a while, yeah, okay. Let me speak about it. <laughs> now we return to Hana Lee, photographed here on the right, in her studio, working on her new series of large portraits. I would be surprised if she has seen what is on her left, but who knows? She wouldn't have had to be in an art history class. Images no longer have a context. The culture of images, the consensus that combines the internet with the view of personhood wouldn't make it hard for this to float into her consciousness. Just typing in weird images could get you quite a lot of food for appropriation. But where is Lee's desire to speak about who we truly are? Sadly, at least with this painting, Lee may have mechanically followed with the rest toward the delusive glamour of blatantly dehumanizing images. If we don't ask ourselves, what do you have to believe to make images like these, sooner or later, we are likely to say, well, all right, maybe so. The revulsion becomes normative just by constant exposure. Oh, I've got the wrong one. Have you seen this one before? OK, sorry. Joe Miser is a professor of art at Bucknell University. This image is on the announcement card for his February exhibition just two months, three months ago. It's called, his exhibition was called Beyond Limitations. This is his statement. Joe Miser is a sculptor. It's written on the back of his card. He wrote it himself. Joe Miser is a sculptor and digital artist who uses his work to address questions about ethics, mortality, and our paradoxical human condition. His projects synthesize ideas from philosophy, science, and religion, while including humor to facilitate insight. It's quite a mouthful. Although Miser's formal education was in sculpture, he now primarily uses CAD software to produce his artwork in order, and here's the quote you can see, to create more flexibly beyond the limitations of the physical world and explore the conceptual and practical potential of the virtual form's uncanny pseudo-presence. Ideas like these, conceptual, create more flexibly, potential and explore, imply progress, while the word limitations implies going backwards, where there is no freedom. And what are the imitations of? The physical world, the real world, the implication is that reality is depressing. It's chained to the past. Dali's surrealist premise, you remember, is to discredit completely the world of reality. CAD, the software that he uses for this, allows you to visualize the unseen sides of a, of a three-dimensional object. The more detailed your algorithms are, the, more better, the better the machine can guess what's around the corner from it. Miser can take a picture of his baby, this is his baby, and turn her image into digital algorithms which follow her form. You get to see what she would look like if you turn her this way and that. He tells us that this picture, the baby, has an uncanny pseudo-presence. We are drawn to pictures of babies. They have their own load of cuteness. But look at her hands. They look like a plastic toy. What is the content of a computer-made image of a person? What is in this child's mind? Which one of these has a story? Which one can we know? It isn't just the content, it's the aggressive artistic replacement of the real, and it's so easy to forget the form, the image, of the real. I missed a self-portrait exhibition which opened at the Met in November, titled, Alter Ego's Projected Selves. 
The description reads, and I quote, this is the Met's description, we all have become accustomed to projecting virtual versions of ourselves, routinely enacting self-portraits. The show consists of works by artists who have deployed themselves as photographic subjects in order to experiment with identity and invent or disrupt narratives, and further, to take the self out of self-portraiture entirely. They explore, this is again the Met, the allure of this ubiquitous genre and alert us to its instability. Last Sunday, the New York Times published an article about a growing movement of people who identify as fictosexuals. This is Akihiko Kondo with his wife, a life-size doll. Miku, the physical version of a computer synthesized pop singer. He has some little stuffed dolls of her as well. Um, the article points out that it's not unusual for a work of art, he calls, to provoke real emotions. Miku appears on his screen as a small hologram created by Gatebox. It was originally marketed to lonely young men and now serves thousands around the world, mostly from the video game, anime, and fan culture. Perhaps you've seen the 2013 science fiction movie, Her. You seen it? You should see it starring Joaquin Phoenix, in which he falls in love with an artificially intelligent woman. I think Miko works essentially like Siri. That's what we know about, or at least I think most of us. Her, her um, she, she, she can ask questions, and she answers, answers the questions, and she records what you say, and then uh, she remembers your wedding anniversary as well only she's a character from pop culture. She has toured with Lady Gaga as a hologram, and she stars in video games. You have to have the copyright to make her yours, so it's expensive to marry her. Miku, unlike a human partner, and this is his, uh, his Kondo's a quote, is always there for him. She'll never betray him, and he'll never have to see her get ill or die. Kondo wants the world to know that advances in artificial intelligence and robotics will allow for more profound interactions with the inanimate. During the pandemic, the company discontinued service for Miku. When Kondo came home and turned on his screen that night, Miku's image had been replaced by the words network error, but he remains faithful to her. If you haven't read any of the current dystopic writing about artificial intelligence in virtual reality, and this is not a slam against artificial intelligence or virtual reality, it's about people, human beings, being replaced by that. So I recommend Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Doerr and the terrific short story Ghost Birds by Kieran Russell. Really good. This is my husband, Ted Prescott, during COVID, we were isolated together for nearly 18 months. We sat four feet apart, day after day, writing, reading, talking, praying. We fought over our limitations. We hugged often. Our studio time was cut in half. I was doing charcoal portraits because I couldn't bring myself to use color. When I finally felt safe, I got out my paints, and I stretched a canvas and tried a landscape. Too idyllic. Then I painted the cows across the street, totally fake. This was the only story I had. One contemporary art critic I admire is Jed, Jed Pearl. His latest book, published in January, is titled Authority and Freedom, A Defense of the Arts. He, uh, he, sorry, he, likes, he likes representational painting. It's probably one reason I like him. Uh, but some years ago, he came to Messiah to give a lecture. I was asked to show him around. It was tough because part of the tour included our gallery. The current one-person show happened to be my paintings. He was polite throughout the tour and looked kindly at the student work and our facilities. When we came to the gallery, I had to tell him, it's my work. He spent a surprisingly long time looking. We talked a little about where my work fits into contemporary painting. And then he said something about the fact that I'm not in a place, 
there in Grantham, Pennsylvania, where the work is likely to get attention in the larger world. I thought, hmm, small-time artist, small-time world. It's not until I was writing this paper that I understood what he meant. It was everything I'm saying here, that art, including my art, doesn't bring tears to my eyes because it's my art, but just what it means, uh, it, that art, including my art, speaks, but to be successful there, I'd have to change my voice. Pearl closed by saying, well, these paintings are really interesting, especially the big narrative pieces, but maybe it's better to stay here and do what you believe. Thank you.